Hallelujah. You know, the word says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's when we stop relying on our strength. Amen. Amen. It's when we stop relying on our talents, our abilities. It's when we stop relying on the world system. It's when we stop all this false entitlement. And we realize that the true source of everything is Jesus. Amen? Amen. He is the true source of everything. If we'll just let him be the source of everything. You know, many times we just need to get out of his stinking way. We're the, we're the ones that bring all the problems. You know, why? Because we let it. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? Well, that knowledge means spiritual understanding. So we get beat up always thinking that our thoughts are our thoughts. We think we're bad and stupid and dumb and all of this stuff. Not that we don't make boneheaded mistakes and we can all become a moron or an idiot occasionally. Amen? But God always has a way of escape out of it. See, our trials and tribulations are experiences for training. But there's a place where you want to get to where you don't do the same stupid thing over and over and over. That's calling, growing, and maturing. But see, God will never force you to do that. He will invite you. He will draw you. But he'll never force you. Never. Not that certain things don't happen because of his influence. Amen. Would you turn to Ezekiel 36 for a moment? You know, every, every one of us has come from a place where we've either brought shame to the name of the Lord or we've used his name in vain. Amen. Well, especially B.C. <coughs> that means before you were born again. But then there's something that begins to happen. We begin to hit so many reality walls that we're like, we get to a point where, you know what, I'm done. I got lumps all over my head. Uh, I got lumps all in my body. I'm tired of being discouraged. I'm tired of being disappointed. I'm tired of disappointing people. I'm tired of, you know, we get to a point where you get so tired of being tired that you end up surrendering. And that's the place when God begins to move. It's a place of surrender. He begins to move. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 23, let's read this together. He says, I will sanctify great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. In other words, when I am reverenced, when I am honored, when I am feared. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean and I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. How many of y'all know you can be the most worst idol? Amen. That's the trinity of me, myself, and I. And verse 26. And I will give you a what? A new heart. And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone, which means heart of rebellion, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, within you. And do what? Cause. Everyone say cause. Ooh. That word cause here means obedient shift. There's an obedience shift. He's going to cause a basically a shift of obedience somehow, some way. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and you will what? Do them. Then you, sh then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. So what's going on right now? There's a lot of things that are happening globally all over. A lot of stuff is being exposed. There's a lot of wickedness being exposed. 
And it's because it is a year of exposure. It's actually a year of explosion. That's a high multitude or high magnitude of exposure. And because of these things, it's the same thing when Jesus went into the temple. He began to kick over temp, the, the money changers. and He began to expose everything. He was actually causing them to do a shift of obedience. Does everybody understand that? He was putting them in a position where they had to make a choice. And the word says, who will you follow today? Whose report will you believe? And are you willing to learn? Are you willing to be trained? Are you willing to battle? Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to submit? And all of these areas, we're finding conflict. The word says something very powerful. He says, judgment begins in the house of God. What is judgment for? It's to redirect individuals. To cause an obedience shift in people's lives. Sometimes things happen agriculturally or through storms or whatever. People have to move to another place. Amen. There's a cause there. And there's things in our life that happens in our life that there's got to be an, an obedience shift. One of the things that the Lord is requiring is that we reach a third level of obedience. That's an obedience beyond what we've known. It's an obedience that is learned. And it can only be learned by the Holy Spirit. And obedience is associated with discipline. We can be disciplined to show up for work on time, but we might not be disciplined to do other things. Does everybody understand that? Because there is a reward involved. There's money involved. But so many times we don't realize that there's a greater reward than what we see here. The reward is by pleasing God. That is the greatest reward. And then when you go home, you will be rewarded openly. Does everybody understand that? You'll be rewarded openly. So sometimes we don't see what's getting ready to happen. But I'm going to tell you that if you continue in an arena of a life of obedience unto Christ, there is great reward. There's great reward. There's even joy in obedience. There's rewards in obedience. The greatest thing that you can know is that you're pleasing God. But you know, it's a terrible place to be when you know you're not. You can justify, you can reason, and you can make every excuse possible. You can blame everybody for your troubles. Why do troubles come? The word tells us. When I went astray from the Lord, then I was afflicted. Amen? Amen? And that's what happens. When we stray from the Lord, we become afflicted. Why? Because protection begins to lift from us. The only thing that's protecting us is the prayers of the saints. If they stop praying, you're in really serious trouble. Amen? I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over. And sometimes the Lord will even say, stop praying for that person. It's in the Word. Stop praying for that person. Why? Because I want to do something with that person. Sometimes a shift of obedience doesn't come until we either get sick or we lose everything. Amen? Or we end up in jail. Whatever it may be. God is bringing a place right now. There's an obedient shift. And you and I are going to cooperate with it or reject it. It is the fork in the road. Who will you serve? Now, a lot of people say, I'll serve the Lord. But really? Do they really? See, there's a place where you and I must be sold out. Completely sold out. And in that place where you're sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D, he takes possession. Amen. In the book of Acts, chapter 9, obedience shift.
Acts chapter 9. Oh, hallelujah. Saul, he believed he was very obedient to God, but he was obedient. His obedience was on the wrong path. The worst thing that can happen to me and you is we can be successful in the wrong assignment. <laughs> it says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples, those were Christians, of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he had found any who were of the way, truth and life, whether men or women and children, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. They are actually imprisoning them and killing them. And they thought they were doing it for God. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I would call that an obedience shift. Now, that would be nice if that happened to every one of us. <laughs> but God does bring revelation for an obedience shift. Do you understand that? If we're willing to receive it. See, but there's got to be something within you that says, I want to please God, and I want to constantly change. I don't want to be the same I was yesterday. I want to be more like him. Amen? There's got to be a, a desire to be constant change. It can't be a one-time event. Why? Because then you'll lose it. There's many people who get healed, get delivered, get filled with the Spirit of God, and they begin to drift. And a disobedience shift begins to establish in them instead of an obedience shift. Look at people who get offended so easy. People who get offended so easy are still living for themselves because they're still fighting for their lives. I've never seen a dead person ever become offended. We're to be dead to self and alive to Christ. But that's a place we must reach. But there must be a desire to reach that. There's an area where we must die a thousand deaths. We die daily, the Word tells us. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. So Saul, who became Paul, fell into an obedience shift. <laughs> In Philippians 3, When you're asking God every day, what do you want me to do? What are you trying to do? Submit to him and obey. But if you're not asking God, what would you like me to do today or how can I please you? Then you're living for yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Philippians 3, verse 1. Let's speak it. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but is for, it is, for you, uh, is for you, it is safe. Beware of what? Dogs. Now, the word dogs here means demonized individual. It's amazing how many people are going around calling each other a dog. Yo, dog! You tell them around, break that off of you, somebody calls you a dog. Because that's an accursed word. Not according to the physical understanding but according to the spiritual understanding, because a dog represents a demonized individual. Beware of dogs. I mean, come on, let's be serious. You think he's going to be talking about dogs that go roof, roof? <laughs> Look out for the dogs, bless your neighbor one. He is not talking about an animal. That little choo chihuahua that grabs your ankles all the time. Look out for him. 
Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in yourself. <laughs> though I am though I also might have confidence in myself, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in himself or flesh, I more so. Now he's going to begin to express how he used to live. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So he thought he was doing everything right and perfect. This was Saul until the Lord, until he ran into the wall of the Lord. And Jesus had to knock him off his horse. But what things, verse 7, were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may what? Know, know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained it or I'm already perfected, but I do what? I press on. I desire more. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Wow. So Saul is expressing, and then he begins to warn about the old life. He warns about a life of self and trust in the flesh, false beliefs of doing the right thing. You know, people believe sometimes they're doing the right thing, but really they're only living out of the mind, but the heart is telling them something else. See, if they would truly listen to what the heart is saying instead of what the mind is saying, they would be convicted. But because the heart is so hardened, it is actually becomes black and blinded. It begins to perch, begin a process of decay and perish where it begins to affect the rest of the body. Again, the first thing, you know, and one of the things that happens is there is no peace in that person. There's anger, torment, resentment, rebellion, blame. That person is in a state of death, spiritual death. Does everybody understand that? Why? Because a person is dying. It's dying and within. No life. Life has been drained from that person. It's just a matter of time where a wrong decision brings destruction completely. It's just a matter of time. No peace. Again, we must come to a place where we must have a want. The first thing we must want to do is change. You know, I'll never forget what the Lord did with me. One of the things he asked me, he said, Guy, do you want to get off of drugs and alcohol? You don't want a new life. And I had to think about that. Because if I wanted a new life, it meant I had to give up everything. Everything. And trust him for him to restore and give me a new life. See, because I tried to get off the drugs and alcohol, but it didn't work. I tried to stop the things that I didn't like to do, but it didn't work. I couldn't do it in my own strength. I couldn't change my attitude. I couldn't change my outburst of wrath. I couldn't change those things. But I wanted to change those things. And I realized I wanted a new life. And, and I would do whatever it took. And I said to the Lord, I want a new life. And you know what he says to me? Show me. Show me. 
Show me that you want a new life. Show me. I'll never forget that, and I never, never will. And I'll share it constantly. You want a new life, you got to show him. You got to show him. You got to be willing to do whatever it takes. You want a new life, you got to show him. Lord, I want a new life, show me. That means that cooperation is the key to getting that new life. See, people just think, oh, you got a new life, great, you're, you're, you're a new creation in Christ. How many people have seen a new creation in Christ still be the same person? Amen. Why? Because they're not willing to go through the process and cooperate with the soul being converted. They're not willing to really change. There is no really true desire to want to change. They only want to change for a benefit. They want to change for a handout. They want to use God. And God will let them use him because he's that kind of a guy. But only for a short period of time. Then he'll step away. And then people fall on their faces. Or they do something stupid, get in trouble or whatever it may be. Or lose whatever. See, because when an obedience shift comes, now you've got to maintain the obedience. Amen? It doesn't mean you won't make a mistake. But if your heart, David, King David made lots of mistakes, but his heart was after the Lord. God forgave him, but he reaped. And there's that law, what you sow is what you reap. So you can't blame someone else what's happening to you. You can't. Because what comes to you, you bring to you. Amen? Somewhere along the line, you don't remember the wrong decision you made multiple years ago that it's finally come up now. Hello. Let's go to Judges 16. God doesn't forget. Judges 16. Now, does it mean he doesn't love us? Of course he loves us. He paid the price for me and you. And he pays the price every single day for me and you. And Judges 16 and verse 13. Delilah and Samson. Well, Samson was called by God. He was a Nazarite. I think he was, you know, one of the first hippies. Let his hair grow and so forth. Wore strange clothes. But the dude was a gorilla. And the anointing that was on him was incredible. God called Samson as a Nazarite. The one thing he couldn't do was cut his hair. And the second thing he couldn't do was indulge in any alcohol. And he was supposed to stay in order according to the Israelites. The ordinances according to God expected him to be in order. But he didn't. He began to fornicate, walk out of divine order. He was used, God was going to use him to rescue the Israelites from the Palestinians, the Philistines. Palestinians, same thing. <laughs> and, and to restore Israel. He was going to use him to destroy them all. And he could do it. But he fell and drifted and fell into fornication. And he met a woman named Delilah, who was actually a harlot. 
And in verse 13, now Delilah, for money, she knew she could get some money if she can get this guy tied up. And he would tell her all the time. He would lie to her. Yeah, if, you, if they do this, uh, if they do whatever, he, tell, he would tell her a lie, then my power would go. And she was driving the guy nuts. But, of course, he stayed there because he fell into lust. Lust can blind. And verse 13, And Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair into the web of a loom, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are, uh, are upon you. And Samson, and, but he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you? <laughs> when your heart is not with me. That sounds like manipulation. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Why didn't he just obey God and leave? It says, depart from evil because he was bound by lust. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more. For he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. It's all about money. Then she lured him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him. <laughs> nice girl. And his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Let me share something with you. God never tells you he's going to depart from you. He does. You may not know it until the time comes to try to overcome a demon that's attacking you and he kicks your butt or he takes over your thoughts. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, because he was blinded, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. 
And Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. It sounds like an obedience shift. O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, was it the Philistines' fault that he lost his eyes? Or was it his? His. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it, so that the dead he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his whole life. So he fulfilled the mission. See, one of the things the enemy wants to do is interfere with the mission you've been called. You did not come into this world without God sending you. No matter how you came, you may think you've been a mistake, but in the eyes of God, you were not a mistake. Does everybody understand that? He picked you to come into this world and fulfill a mission. But the whole time we were here, we've been distracted, misled. Going for fulfillment and the feeling in the wrong places because we came from the presence of God. And that's why we want to feel so good. So we fell into sin and hoped that that would feel better. Never realizing it was the presence of God we were looking for. Fell into drugs, alcohol, loss, all kinds of other things, false fulfillments. Getting an education to fulfill good about jobs and whatever. Becoming intellectual but never getting a hold of God's presence in that place. Even becoming religious but never grabbing hold of that place of God's presence where everything is revealed, everything is released, and it is the greatest feeling that you and I could have. Amen? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. It looks like Samson fell into a place of an obedient shift, but he had to wait till he lost his eyes and become a prisoner and an entertainer for the wicked ones. In 1 Chronicles 21. We don't need to lose our eyes, right? We don't need to become a prisoner. <laughs> Some people may never get it until they go to jail. Some people don't get it until they go to jail. I went to jail the first time and it still didn't do any good. Because I didn't have the power of Christ. I tried to do it in my own strength. And I got rescued from a life sentence. And I was still an idiot. But God knocked me off my horse. Or maybe Harley, I think it was. Chronicles 21. In verse 1. Is everybody there? Let's read it. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now that was, in other words, your influence. One of the things that the enemy is going to try to do is influence you to get out of position. So that obedience is ceased and disobedience begins. Satan stood up against David. In other words, he influenced him. He spoke to him. He sent him probably a few demons to him to try and entice him. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Bathsheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Now, David was not supposed to number the people. In fact, his chief commanders knew it also. And Joab answered and said, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But, my Lord the king, 
Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? So even his servants knew, look at man, this is going to cause a shift in obedience. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and the Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Hmm. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Why? Because he was still going to... Let me share with you, you still reap what you sow. I'm going to say it again. You still reap what you sow. So when you repent and you stop, what is, that means you're not going to reap anymore. But you still will reap what you sow. The only way out to reap what you sow is to turn, repent, but sow back into the Spirit so that you can outrun your reaping. If you do not sow back into the Spirit, you will now outrun your reaping and you will reap what you sowed. Everybody get it? That's where people don't get it. They're wondering why things aren't happening, why things aren't changing, because they stop sowing in the Spirit. Sowing in the Spirit is not reading your word. Sowing in the Spirit must come out of your mouth. That's why it's called sowing in the Spirit. You sow in the Spirit by praise and worship. You sow in the Spirit by decree in the Word. It is not reading your Bible. Somebody get it? You must speak it. It must come out of your mouth. If you're not willing to humble yourself and sow in the Spirit, then you will reap what you sowed. And he who reaps to the flesh, sows to the flesh, reaps corruption. And he who sows to the Spirit, reaps life and peace. That's why some people will never have peace. They'll be tormented their whole life. They'll walk around with anxiety and stress because they've never sowed their way out. It's always sowing your way out. That's how the kingdom operates. It is a law. It is a law for all mankind. What you sow is what you reap. Is everybody okay? So David had three choices. Now he had to reap even though he repented. He had to reap what he sowed. And the Lord said, okay, I'm going to make you three offers. Choose one of them. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you or else for three days the sword of the Lord. And the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad the seer, I am in great distress. You betcha. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, it is enough, now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ormnon, the Jezebite. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and not my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. 
Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the, the Jebusite. So David went up, to the word, went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. In other words, he had to sow in the spirit. At that time, sowing in the spirit was sacrifices and building altars. Does everybody understand that? Okay. He had to turn around. But look at, see, here he was on a path of obedience. And then there became an obedient shift, which was actually a disobedient shift. But it brought disaster to those around him. It hurt him emotionally to see what he caused to other people. Does everybody understand that? Sometimes that's more hurtful than what you've done to yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? But if your heart's so hardened, it ain't, you don't care. There's no care about that. But in that, God is merciful. He never gives up on us, does he? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Hebrews 12. Is everybody okay? I want you to know that there's an obedient shift being caused right now, not only in this country, but globally. God is giving people an opportunity. But things are about to change tremendously. Hebrews 12 and verse 3. Is everybody there? Oh, glory. Let's speak it together. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, that was Jesus, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor, his, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now, sometimes we don't understand that. <laughs> How many times have you thought, especially B.C. or maybe even after, I don't know. If God loved me so much, why would he done this to me? Blaming God for what we're bringing on ourselves. He didn't do it to you. We brought it on ourselves. Amen. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, chastening, the purpose of chastening is to bring correction. Amen. It's to bring correction so, and direction so we can get on the right path. So we, in other words, his hope is to cause an obedience shift because of the place of disobedience. And, you know, what does the world use? I mean, that's why there's police. That's why there's laws. That's why there's probation. That's why there's prisons. That's why there's detention centers. That's why... All kinds of things. Why? Because the hope of chastisement from the world would bring an obedient shift. Amen? In verse 7, he's, and, and the Lord, he says here, if you, are, if you endure chasing it, in other words, enduring it means you accept it. You want to change. You want to change course. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons and daughters. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not a son. Furthermore, we had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and what? And live. Remember, what you sow is what you reap. You sow respect, you reap respect. Amen? People want respect when they've never even sowed it. Oh, praise God. Chastening brings correction, direction, and also protection. That is the main thing. Because when we get back into order, God protects us. He protects us. He puts people in place to pray for me and you. It's an obedience shift. Now, 
there's a place during this time because chastening doesn't feel so good. But if we're willing to accept it, we, for us, when we're being chastened, it seems like suffering. But suffering is a part of learning. We learn. You know, when I went to prison, I didn't want to be away from my family, but it was a part of it. When people go into drug programs, they don't want to be away from their families, but they know it's the best thing for them. Amen? So, but the thing is, is you can go to prison and go to a drug for everyone or go wherever, but if you're not open heart to be willing to change, you're going to leave the same way you came in. You'll have knowledge, but no change. Why? Because there must be an area to where you want to change and you want to get in that obedience shift. If you're not, you'll go right back to the old way. And then you'll return and start all over again and all the other garbage. Amen? So we must allow these chastening times to be training for me and you. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 2. So one of the things God is doing right now is the word says that judgment is being released. The purpose of judgment is chastening. And it's happening globally. And in this judgment, it is hope that people will turn before God's wrath. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 5, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought to rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such uh, a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in what? All. Obedient in all things. How many of you know God puts us to the test? Amen. Amen. The test is whether we are obedient, whether... <laughs> There will be challenges in your life. God wants to know how you're going to handle it. Are you going to handle it in a Christ-like manner or an old manner? Amen? He wants to know if you're going to maintain a, a, a direction of obedience or come off course to disobedience. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Praise God. You know, there was another individual called Saul. He was a king. And in this part, and I'm going to go there, King Saul was chosen by God. In fact, he was the first king. And the people required to have a king, and God said, I'll be your king. And they said, no, we want a king. And he said, okay, he's going to tax you. He's going to steal from you. He's going to do all good. And they t so God gave him a king. His name was Saul. But he was a humble man in the beginning, but God began to send him on missions and battles, and Saul became prideful. He began to compromise what God was asking him to do. And so Saul came back one day and Samuel the prophet came up to him because he had been changing course on what he was supposed to do too many times and the Lord said, I'm taking the kingdom from you. He says, I sacrifice an offering I don't require but it is obedience that I require. It is better. It is better. And disobedience is a form of witchcraft. So that means it's demonic influence. And so he lost the kingdom and eventually he died. And first Peter chapter one.
See, remember, we're to discern our influence, whether it's of God or it's not of God. That's why he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have what? Purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers as flowers falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the Word by which the Gospel was preached to you. Purify your souls by obeying the truth. Let me share with you t something vitally important. Your success of tomorrow is in direct proportion to the depth of your obedience today. It is in direct proportion. In Romans 6, I'll say it again. Your success of tomorrow is in, a, in direct proportion of the depth of your obedience today. Your success of tomorrow is in direct proportion of the depth of your obedience today. In other words, what your obedience today is waiting for you tomorrow. In Romans 6, How many of y'all know that when people are doing the wrong thing, they get caught, they usually try to do the right thing? <laughs> it's, it's caused an obedience shift. Well, they, you'd hope they are. You know, they'd be idiots if they don't. But if there isn't a pure sorrow, a pure arena of repentance, then that person won't. They, they say they're sorry and whatever, but they really don't mean it because they really don't want to change. And they'll stay that way. In Romans 6, 15. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to what? Righteousness. But God be thanked that Though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you were presented, your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for what? For holiness. Obedience of sin to death, again, sin is rebellion, or obedience that leads to righteousness. Let's go to Romans 1 for a minute. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. There is a global obedience shift. <laughs> Everybody will have the opportunity. Amen. Some people still need to be dragged through the bushes and thorn bushes. <laughs> have to go through hell. 
to get to heaven. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may have been known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everybody tell each other, you are without excuse. No excuse. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to what? Uncleanness. He let them go. And in lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their own women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. In other words, women with women and women with animals. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman, meaning men with men and men with animals. Burning their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. See, God will allow the enemy to take you and to you come to a place of surrender. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder, strife, deceit, vile-mindedness, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, and boasters, inventors of evil things and disobedient to parents undiscerning and untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Wow. So you may not be one who practices it, but you approve of it. You'll be judged the same way. Does everybody understand that? Huh. As the obedience shift brought a change to disobedience shift. Fell out of order. Changed their individuals. Increased evil lust. Changed their character. False approval of evil. And divine judgment. James chapter 1. This is not a doomsday message. <laughs> this is a warning. <laughs> In other words, get it right. Hallelujah. But those who are in position are blessed of the Lord. Praise God. Because the word says those who are in position, we are not accounted for the wrath of God. James chapter 1, verse 21. Let's speak it. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your butt. Verse 22. But be a doer of the word. So if you're not a reader of the word, you're not going to do nothing. You're going to follow the order. You're going to do how you feel. Live a life of emotion. Make wrong decisions. Associate with wrong people. And so in the flesh. And reap corruption. 
Therefore, lay aside of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save you. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and is not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. For he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and what? Continues in it. And is not a forgetful hero, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. How many of y'all want to be blessed? Then you got to be a doer of the word. That's bottom line. Or else you're going to end up sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. Doer. Continue. We, in other words, when a, an, a, an obedient shift comes, now we got to continue so it maintains that. It's not, oh, I'm going to obey today and tomorrow I'll not obey. And I'm going to close at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Remember that song? Everybody plays a fool sometimes. There's no exception to the rule. <laughs> Glory. Glory. We've all played the fool, haven't we? But thank God he takes the foolish things. Boy, were we foolish out there. But he can turn you. One of the things God loves to do is turn you into one of his trophies. He takes you all messed up and all bleh. Rejected by men. Can't do it anymore. And you're just a mess. And he takes you and he says, come on, get on the potter's wheel. Plop. Let me just mush this. <laughs> Let's go. And then he takes you and starts molding you. And then he puts you in his hand so you become a trophy. If you're willing to stay on that hand long enough. If you're willing to receive counsel, correction, and direction. If you're willing to receive the chastening of the Lord. If you're willing to maintain in a life of obedience. See, this is life. People choose a life of darkness and deception compared to a life of light, love, peace. And false belief systems. My goodness, what opportunities. How many times did God try to warn us already? Man, I used to have buses that drew, drove by and said, today's the day. <laughs> You know, you, you drive up behind someone and, say, and it's, there's a message on their license plate or so they have a bumper sticker, you know, that tells you something. Today's the day. This is, Jesus loves you, you know, whatever. Man, when, you know, when you're in the world and you've got demons in you, when someone says Jesus loves you, you're like, rawr, rawr. <laughs> Those things start manifesting in your head. <laughs> You know, you just, man, Jesus loves you. Ah! I remember one time one guy said, man, Jesus, I was about to kill him. I didn't want to hear that stuff. Because I was still in the blame. If Jesus loved me so much, why am I still an addict? Because I wasn't willing to take the way of escape. Oh, man, he, he makes a way of escape for everything. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Is everybody there? Amen. Verse 3. Let's speak it. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of each one of you also abounds towards each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Why? Because it was bringing training to them. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. 
since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness and work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. What will it take for an obedient shift? How much do we have to go through to finally come into a place where you're willing to obey all the way to the end? Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask for your mercies and your grace and the seed that's been imparted in us, Lord. Let this come to remembrance to us by the Holy Spirit, protected by the blood. And as it begins to work in us and we fall into that place, of submission, surrender, and humbleness so that we can fulfill your will. Let us walk in the path and the mission of obedience for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give somebody a hug and tell them stay dressed and possessed with the glory of God.